and, and welcome to the Davies Use Case Webinar being presented by Parkland Health and Hospital System on Mobile Communications. This is the Davies Award-winning Use Case for the Value of Health IT. My name is Arnold Simmons. I'm the Manager of Quality and Patient Safety, and it's my pleasure to moderate this presentation. Core to the HIMSS mission is promoting the use of health IT to improve the quality of healthcare delivery. HIMSS promotes and advocates the integration of clinical decision support and best practice guidance, access to clinical data to analyze progress, and IT enables patient safety tools for all healthcare organizations, clinicians, patients, community members as vehicles for improving patient outcomes. The HIMSS Nicholas E. Davies Award of Excellence is the pinnacle of the HIMSS Value Recognition Program. The Davies Award recognizes outstanding achievement of organizations from around the world who have utilized health information technology to improve outcomes and value. The Davies Award's winning use cases have been peer-reviewed to validate the sustainable, improved patient and business outcomes resulting from health IT-enabled care delivery. It is my pleasure to welcome our speakers for today's webinar, and I'll Dr. Brett Moran, Judy Harrington, and Joseph Wongo from um, Parkland, and I'll turn it over to you all. We'll be talking about how Parkland implemented a mobile communication solution to address uh, a new issue as they migrated to the new Parkland Hospital, which was considerably bigger than their old campus. And I'm the Chief Medical Information Officer at Parkland and Associate Chief Medical. Vice President of Nursing for Medicine Services at Parkland, and I'll be here speaking regarding the nursing component of the technology that we're using at New Parkland. Enterprise Technologies here at Parkland, and I'll be giving an overview of our uh, infrastructure and some of the solution uh, decisions that we made uh, to embark on this journey. to decentralized nursing models when we moved from our old Parkland Hospital to our new Parkland Hospital, we discovered a new communication challenge that we had overcome. We had to span a 3.5 million square feet facility and ensure nurses in a department that could be as far as three football fields away could still communicate seamlessly. Nurses helps a lot compared to being in a centralized nursing model. And we as IT found ourselves, uh, for one of a, the first time, being a close member of the care team and finding ourselves in the ability to facilitate the continuum of care. We looked at technology to address this new space issue. The solution had to be scalable and capable with a wide variety of source systems, and it had to have a rules-based engine. Applied devices were standardized on the Zebra MC40. We did exhaustive research on devices that could work in our environment and then did a user fair with six or seven different options. The Democratic vote indicated that the MC40 was the device chosen by the majority. It was rugged enough for our ED and ICUs with swappable batteries. It was infection prevention compliant, impact resistant, and was not the most stealable device. OS and was compatible with our MDM and is now compatible with our Epic Rover. This is the devices in our nurses' tool belt. All non-providers received an MC40, as well as many clinical support staff, and our total deployment is a little bit over 2,000 devices. 
IOD or bring your own device strategy for providers. After assessing the provider's needs and preferences, it became hard to standardize on one device. We also assessed the financial impact to supply devices to our migrant or rotating provider workforce, and it was feasible to provide them, it was not feasible to provide them a Parkland device. We then responded to our BYOD strategy, as you can see from this slide. Solution, we found the solution was secure. We were empowered to put more clinically relevant data across the solution compared to the pager solution that we used in the legacy system. We had the adoption component to, to tackle. We first piloted uh, a few use cases in our old facility, which had typical infrastructure limitations in a 65-year-old building. and helped us soften the training curve for some of the folks that would now be using this newer technology opposed to face-to-face -face communication. Now I'll show you some of the use cases that we implemented over the past year, leveraging this solution to solve problems for communicating clinically and to adjacent areas. I'll now turn over the speaking to Brett Moran. Talking about the impact of the technology on nursing and how we use this technology with nursing. This first slide talks about our new nurse call alert system and how this system integrates with the MC40 in his um, introduction. We currently use a Roland Borg call system, and it is integrated with the MC40s. And then, you know, historically in the old institution, the patient pushed the button, it called the nursing station, and then the clerk had to figure out what the patient wanted. Um, so there was a lot of delay in trying to determine what was needed and, and how to get that information to the patient. So now with the new nurse call alert system, the actual patient pillow button, the pillow speaker that you see on the left, has four separate um, can call directly for pain, potty, ice, and then there's a generic nurse call. The, this allows the patient to directly get to the caregiver that they need for the issue and so that we can route the correct skill set and we don't waste our RNs on ice or potty calls that can go directly to the PCAs. It eliminates the middleman of having it to be filtered through our clerk staff up at the desk. And it also reduces noise pollution because our call lights are not going off. That call is going directly to the MC40 device carried by the clinicians. We found that to be a huge um, relief with the nursing staff. As Joe mentioned, our new facility is considerably bigger. Our average nursing unit is one football field long. So having the ability to get those calls earlier and being able to get to the room has been very successful for the nursing staff. And it's kind of a display of how many calls we, we experience across the organization on a given day. And you can see that it's often over 6,000 uh, calls are going to the nurses or to the patient care assistant regarding patient care, uh, patient community. He represents the way we had the system set up in the old hospital before we had engaged, which is the system that the MC40 nurses run on. And so you can see where it has the call going from the patient to the clerk, the clerk having to do a triage algorithm to decide how to get to, if that nurse is tied up, then the clerk is having to page overhead trying to find another nurse or someone else to manage that call for the patient. At the new hospital, this algorithm pushes a button and the call goes directly to the nurse. If that nurse is busy and not able to take that call, she has the ability to decline that call. And then that call based on an algorithm tree that we built an escalation tree can go to the next nurse on the list all the way up. We have the ability for it to go up to four different levels where we can route it back. Um, if all the nurses decline that it does go to our charge nurse, then they can certainly escalate that call. So we found this model to be very successful in making sure that we get to the patient's bedside much sooner with the correct information. And what's really nice is if the issue is about pain, we don't have to go to the bedside to find out it's about pain then go back and get the meds. If we know it's about pain, we can get the med and take it directly to the bedside. It's been a huge patient satisfaction. 
We went from uh, you know up to eight minutes or more to answer a call playing uh, playing phone tag between the health uh, unit clerk and the nurse. Now to most of these calls being dealt with within two or even three minutes of more than percent reduction. One that's very helpful. This is a staff assist call where if a nurse or a PTA is in a patient's room and they need assistance of a secondary staff member, historically in the past we had to stop what we were doing and go roam up and down the hall and try to find someone that could come in and assist you. Now we have the ability to send out a staff assist call where you could designate um, that you need assistance with either a secondary RN or a PCA and this graph shows the response time of how we've been able to get coworker assistance considerably faster in the new institution. In calls, we've kind of, if you cut on the left, you can see where we calculate out our response times to toileting calls. This one is probably the single biggest success factor we've had with incre increasing response times or decreasing response time as the single biggest root cause that we have around our patient falls are delays in getting to patients that need toileting assist. We have a, a fairly autonomous patient population that unfortunately um, likes to independently get up and head to the restroom. So if we don't respond to these calls in a timely manner, they will get up independently, which increases their risk for falls. So this has been a great um, safety enhancement for our system. And as the numbers show, I mean, the the efficiency that we gain from this uh, will help improve our timeliness of care, improve the satisfaction of the patient, um, reduce potential adverse uh, outcomes, and also uh, increase time in the staff uh, to, to go do other patient care related activities. So in, in this instance, over 21 hours uh, per week were reduced uh, in assisting getting more rapid toileting. Is the biggest significance, and this is just in the generic patient call, and this is where the patient calls the nurse directly with a, without having a specific category, and while that seems like that's not very helpful, it is because the nurse can usually triage that call right on the phone and resolve the issue as opposed to the patient having to live on the call light waiting for someone to call. We can usually meet their needs in today's arena of HCAP. Getting to meet that patient's needs um, prompter like that has is, is been a huge um, improvement in satisfaction. And as Dr. Moran has said, if you look on the graph, he capped this one out, and it shows that it's a 13.5 month save per year, which is a rather dramatic reduction in our service response time. Our, with a lot of our hospital systems, as Joe talked about on the platform, the huge one that's been for the nursing staff is they're integrated with our bedside Phillips monitors. We have bedside monitors on our PCU and our ICUs, so those nurses have direct access to the patients information and then on our generic, not generic, that's a terrible word, on our regular nursing units, we have wireless telemetry throughout our hospital on all of our, our medicine, tele, medicine surgery and in our women and infants floors. And they also receive all their direct messaging from our telemetry war room. We do remote tele and they communicate through our MC40s so we get direct notification from them if a patient is having an arrhythmia or if they see something and they can call us directly on those MC40s. And we can say no, the patient's brushing their teeth or something like that and let them know that it's a false alarm. So there's a significant number of alerts that come through that system. And we first moved in, there was a little bit of um, staff, but we've had great success with um, the MC40 system and our telemetry system. Can I and I'll interject at, at this point. I think oftentimes viewers start looking at these slides and the numbers of alerts and um, start questioning whether this organization may be experiencing alert fatigue. And, and I will tell you that we do have an alert, alerts and alarms committee where we look at which alerts are actually going to the, um, the, the nurse and the provider devices to try to, to reduce the signal to noise uh, ratio to improve the specificity of it. And, and when it comes to these kind of alerts and alarms, the nursing staff say they want them, they find them valuable, but we have had some alarms that we've turned off, so we try we try to be good stewards about that. We actually tried to turn some alarms off in our neonatal ICU related to oxygen saturation that we thought were nuisance level alarms based on the statistics and looking at them and the, the neonatal ICU nurses came back and categorically did not want us to turn off those alerts. Um, they wanted to know about those babies because their dips were much more significant with the adults. So having multidisciplinary representation on that alert committee has been huge in letting us know that we're getting the right alerts to the right people.
something that's been a success for nursing. This is using the MC40 devices to help drive practice improvement and meet regulatory compliance. One of the issues that we had in previous Joint Commission surveys and a CMS survey was we had a low success rate with responding to patients' pain. We were responding to pain well, but what we weren't doing was going back and documenting that we were doing reassessment of the pain effectiveness. Our goal is to do that within one hour and hopefully within 30 minutes on an IV pain med. So we set the system up that when we trigger this system and we give an IV pain med, it will actually send the nurse an alert at 60 minutes. It says pain reassessment required. And the nurses can go back and, and it's a great prompter when they're in the middle of something to go back and see that patient. We are currently running approximately a 97% um, compliance rate with that since we implemented this system. We just recently had a mock joint commission survey from an outside vendor and they were able to validate our success with this metrics and said it's been one of the more successful ways they've seen pain reassessment managed in a nursing area. Yeah. It's a significant improvement. Um, a thousand times the time I'm safe. So we're down to 52 days left over the course of a year. It's been a huge satisfier for the nurses, though, because there's nothing worse than finding out an hour later that you forgot to go back and chart something when you have good intentions but with all the multi-distractions that the nurses have, the MC40s have really allowed us to use our time wisely and get where we need to be. Over in our women and infants division, they have a couple of systems. I'm, I'm personally in adult health, and so this was a system that's very interesting. They use their MC40s obviously different than we do. They have a baby blue system, and their baby blue system is the system that activates their neonatal response team. They have a team that comes in on the deliveries, and then if a baby gets in distress, so they average between two and 500 alarms per week, which I'm sure sounds like a lot. Our neonatal ICU um, just this past week had a capacity of 94. Our goal is 88, so their census can get pretty big when you add in the newborn nursery. So these alarms are critical for them to make sure that that neonatal response team gets where it needs to be. So that's the baby blue system. And then also on the bottom, you'll see we have a system called Talk Guard, which we implemented when we came over here in New Parkland, which is part of our infant security protection where they ban the babies and the moms. And we can flag if there is a baby that is leaving an area that they're not supposed to be leaving or, you know, possibly someone trying to take a child. And it sets off an alerter. And then all the staff are, are notified immediately. It goes to all the phones. And everybody is immediately alerted that there's an issue and we can all congregate where we need to go to make sure we're keeping our infants safe. Yeah, and so with the, the baby blue, again, in, in the previous uh, iterations before we had mobile communication strategy, it would be an overhead announcement and people may be in places where they couldn't hear it. Uh, and, and so the response time was not ideal with it going directly to the vi devices and in a Secure encrypted manner so that more uh, information can be included that's readily actionable. Uh, we were able to get our response time down by saving over 77 seconds uh, per per call for for the baby blue. Uh, so much more responsive, saving 53.5 hours less per week. The babies are in distress, waiting for the team to come and, and help the nurse. The uh, pediatric baby blue, and again there was remarkable saving uh, when, again, we went uh, from a, in the middle man and having people call the operator or the hub and going straight to directly to the resuscitation team. Massive improvement, efficient saving. What I personally find the most exciting thing that we implemented, which is on the MC40 funds, we implemented a software called Engage, which is a secure encrypted HIPAA compliant software where we are able to do secure messaging between the nursing staff and the provider staff. And in the past, we used a paging system, a simple paging system, and the way we communicated when I paged a provider was, I would say patient MK12, sending an initial and an MR into a provider, and we're talking in trying to make sure that we're staying HIPAA compliant and it really was complicated. I would page the provider. I'd have to wait for the provider to call back. The provider would call back. I would be busy. And so there was a lot of non-productive sitting around waiting on people to call back. So when we implemented the engage system, we had to really work hard to get providers and nursing to engage. And then once we got it going and everybody really understood what it was, it's been brilliant. And so what this system allows is direct communication, text communication between providers and nurses that's encrypted. 
you can locate the person that you're trying to reach either by searching through the patient where it shows you the entire patient um, provider or their care team, not just physicians. Everybody associated with that patient, you can search by the patient's name, you can search by the provider's name, or you can search by the provider team, depending on if you're looking for a particular service team. It'll certainly send a message to a provider, they can respond back. We have audit trail capability if we need to print. If we have people that are saying they didn't get a message, we can actually print that and go back and show where there was escalation or alerting, so it helps us with our QI on that. And then with rules-based escalation, if we don't get a response from a provider and we need a response, we can certainly use where we can trigger to go up to from a resident to or an intern to a resident to an attending if we need to get immediate response. And, and I'll second what Judy said. I mean, this was huge, you know, from the days of pagers where you play phone tag and, and then as a physician you call and you have to call the front desk and they page the nurse overhead and there's noise pollution and you're waiting and... and um, to being able to immediately uh, securely message them, and you can include PHI. And, and what we found is that the nurses and providers both love the secure messaging. Rather than calling and having to wait for both people to be available to step out and talk, to be able to get to the message in a readily uh, timely manner, uh, but when it's convenient for you, and to be able to securely encryptly, in an encrypted way talk back to them and include pertinent details really a massive step forward for the hospital. Great. The volume of calls that we're getting to, kind of going back and alluding to what Brett talked about, about volume of calls going back um, between nursing and the providers. So one thing that we didn't mention, too, is it's not just nursing carrying these MC40 phones. We have rolled them out to some of our other subspecialties. Our respiratory therapists are now carrying these phones, and that's been huge. Because one of the other issues the nurses and the RTs get now is we actually get notified via our MC40s of stat orders. Historically, in the past, we've tried everything from clipboards to a variety of other ways to let caregivers know there's stat orders in the chart. But unless you happen to be in that patient's chart, you're really not getting notified that there's a stat order without having someone constantly monitoring dashboards, looking for you know, visual cues or bells and alerts. So now with the um, Engage and the MC40 systems, we get those orders directly to the caregivers and we can go and figure out what needs to be activated. We also get critical lab results directly from our lab and we've limited that to critical lab results just to keep the volume of alerts down. This is a huge issue in our ICU, certainly with our anticoagulation labs and then our electrolyte labs so that we're able to respond to those alerts in a much faster fashion. We don't have results sitting on the charts for four and six hours waiting for someone to notice them anymore. So this has been hugely helpful in us meeting our critical value turnaround time. How the patient is set up in EPIC, we have a lot of logic in who is assigned when the nurses come on every morning, they attribute themselves with the patient. And so the message system sends it directly to the nurse that's responsible for that patient. The same thing is in places that the nurse is tied up with another patient and can't take that message. She does have the ability to refer that message to her charge nurse to allow someone else to respond to that in a timely manner so we don't lose the timeliness of the message. This kind of goes back to what we talked about with, with alerts and alarms and, and kind of our, our governance of that. And what we're, I think this is a great uh, example of, of the right thing to use these for, which is just in time, uh, items that require timely attention to, to the patient. And, and so stat orders, and critical lab results are perfect examples of when you do want someone to get some device on their mobile, uh, whereas there are some things, routine orders, or there are a lot of other examples where uh, there may be uh, alerts or alarms that people are asking for that just aren't aren't really time sensitive, and therefore this becomes more of a nuisance. And but uh, these are perfect examples of, of instances where we find them to be high value. What our current um, Rollenberg call system is by the door. This is not the one that patients use. This is a staff use terminal. What this is used, this has been a hugely successful um, technology we integrated as well, is we're notified um, via our phones on the MC40s when a patient has been assigned to our unit and we're getting message letting us know that the bed is ready. And then the, one of the big issues that we were having is when um, other departments would bring us patients and put them in rooms, if a nurse wasn't immediately available, you would find people in a bed. And that's certainly a safety risk because we don't want patients being unattended. So one of the things that we set up was, if you look on that particular console at the bottom, the two blue boxes, patient arrival and patient pickup, 
that's been hugely successful for our transport departments. When they show up with a new patient and our ER shows up with a new admission, they push that button and it sends a direct message to the nurse and the PCA assigned to that room to let them know that a new admission is in that room and they can promptly go and assist with transferring that patient to the bed. It also, under the patient pickup, that's another um, big success issue because one of the things that we need to make sure is that the patient needs to you know, have O2 hookup or anything else, or if anesthesia is there and needs an R in there, they can push that button and let us know that someone is ready to pick that patient up to go for a procedure. And we have it set up with the logic of whether you want a PCA or an RN. Also on there, you see on the, the left and right side where it talks about rounding, we've used this button. If there's someone that we are concerned about pressure alert, ulcer development on a patient, we can, as every time we leave the room, we can set it up to remind us to send us a flag. And if you have a PCA or an RN, or if there's another reason you want to come back to the room, it'll send you a secondary alert separate from the pain to come back and check on this patient in the room if you need to have rounding. So that's been very successful also with our HCAPs and our pressure ulcer prevention. And this ties in nicely with kind of what, what Joe said at the beginning, which is with our mobile solution, we've tied it in with the entire infrastructure from a, a health information technology. And so we have some mobile solution strategies that involve automated alert, uh, automa automated uh, kind of formulas and decision support. And then there are others where it can be manual, such as Judy just talked about, where if you want a reminder to your mobile device after a certain period of time, you can select who you are and what the time frame. So people can use it even in a customized manner. And then we have some baked in based on pain reassessment, and we have some baked in based on, you know, patient pickup. But all of these work with the kind of enterprise solution of using the mobile uh, devices in a meaningful manner. Transport turnaround time, and this is from 2016, and you can see on average uh, how it was running as far as the average transport time was just about, uh, you know, between uh, 27, around 27. And then recently, and you can see that it has dropped and seems to be averaging more in the low 20 kind of range. So, again, significant uh, turnaround time by having the nurses and the care team much more timely in the response to helping with the ticket to ride when a patient is leaving and helping re meeting 30, 20. When we first went live with the Engage system was making sure that the system knew who was responsible for the patient. So attribution was a key issue was we really had to figure out how to make sure the system and, and how we got the nurses to sign into Epic to um, get themselves assigned to a patient. So one of the things that we did is we worked with our informatics team and we actually have a, a, a pop-up that pops up every time an RN signs into Epic where it allows you to attribute all the patients on your assignment to you. And it, it pops up for all RNs. So it pops up for me when I sign on. Once you attribute yourself to patients, you don't get that pop-up anymore, but if not. And with that pop-up, and we have it preset to where the nurses can sign on in four, eight, or 12-hour increments to, and I think 10 hours as well, and it pre-signs you out at the end of it. So our issue of having multiple people showing, showing up, being assigned to the patient as nurses has not been a problem anymore. And so we implemented that probably within three months of moving in, and that dramatically increased. We monitor our attribution. I may have one or two fallouts a day, but in general, we have not had any issues. We have pretty much 99 to 100% compliance with our nurses being assigned into EPIC, and that's been hugely successful for the providers when they look and engage or they come up on the unit and want to know who's responsible for a patient. And then Dr. Moran can talk about how we've had in the adoption with the providers as well. Right, on the, on the same... On the same side of the coin as Judy, we need to have attribution from the providers and, and the nurses and the ancillary staff absolutely have to know who the provider is that's taking care of a patient at any given moment. And what we found was in the past, it was kind of anecdotal. And if you, you know, if you worked in a unit, you would know who was covering. And, and if you knew the right signal or handshake or wink, you could figure it out. But if someone was coming onto a unit and didn't know all the special secrets or who to talk to, you wouldn't. So. We embarked on this standardization, and that was something we began several years ago, and we mandated that everybody attribute themselves to the patients that they're taking care of. And the functionality of the EMR allows that in an easy way, where when you sign in for the first time, it asks you who you're taking care of and how long you're going to be there. When you sign in at that point, then it assigns you to the treatment team, 
and it also transmits that to the mobile communications application. And so within the mobile app, you can then click on any given patient, and you can see the example here on the left. When you click on a patient up here whose name is grayed out, you see all the members of the team, and you can see the PCA, you can see the pharmacist, you can see the primary nurse, you can see the first call provider, you can see the second call, you can see the care coordinator. And when you click on any one of those, then you have the option of secure messaging them or phoning them directly. And, and that's a huge time saver. And I think one of the things that Dr. Moran just touched on that was huge from nursing perspective as well is if you look under Robert Arias' name there, it says first call provider attending provider. One of the issues that we would have with nursing is there would be four or five different physicians assigned to one patient. One is a nephrology consult. One is, you know, the palliative care team. And you wouldn't necessarily know who to call. So one of the things that we really work with the medical staff and they've been really, really helpful for is it has role-based attribution as well. You're not just signing to the patient. You're putting yourself in a role as, are you first call provider? Are you attending? And that way, when the nursing staff, we now know to call, because what's worse that creates tension is when you're calling the wrong person and there's, you know, a first call provider person is who we're supposed to be calling. So that's really been helpful is making sure that there's role-based login, not just login. We'll see, with our, with our analytic uh, capabilities, we've been able to measure um, how well the, the service lines are doing with attributing themselves. So as Judy said, this is a, an initiative we, we took on for the last several years, and we have encouraged people. We have told them the value of it. We've given carrots with, uh, you know, rewarding people with recognition for appropriate attribution. But we also have the stick in that we measure uh, service lines. So here, this graph just shows the percent of time for which there wasn't a first call provider list. And you can see most service lines did a really good job, but there's a couple of service lines that were outliers. And this allows us to take this information to the, the leadership of those areas and have them work on ensuring better compliance. Um, there's other, other ways that we've used our mobile communication strategy is that we have had some issues with communication for reassessment uh, after anesthesia or even epidural removal uh, with people playing phone tag or paging. And again, with the anesthesiologist, they're often in many different places. They may be down in radiology in a lead-lined room and the page may have not gone through, but we don't know that. When we use our mobile communication solution, we have the capability of escalating things automatically. So if it's not accepted, if, if someone doesn't accept this epidural message within five minutes, it moves to the next anesthesiologist on call. Um, and again, because we're not using pagers, we're using a secure encrypted app. We can put much more communication that allows them to find the patient in the right room, the right patient, the right. So we we found that these were huge um, safety uh, proof. We've also been to using our mobile solution in more innovative ways, and so we have luminary uh, partnerships with with several of our our vendor application. Uh, service uh, line, and and we were, were working for improving alerting uh, providers when their patients have a critical radiology notification. And I know a lot of institutions just have a an FTE or two who calls people manually and they play phone tag. Um, because of Parkland size, that makes it harder because it would be several FTEs worth of people. And so we you know we were looking for a way to do this in an innovative way and by by looking at our PAX vendor, our EMR, and our mobile solutions, we're able to take a critical notification out of the PAX system, um, look to the EMR to find out who is the appropriate attributed person taking care of the patient, not who put in the order, because often who put in the order is not who's on call or who's in the hospital at that moment, but we can find out who's taking care of the patient at that moment, and then we can escalate sending the notification through the mobile app to them. And if they don't, it escalates to the second call provider, the attending, to the service line chief, to the associate chief medical officer, et cetera. So we're able to escalate these things automatically until someone responds to this critical notification. So this is just another good example of, of using the mobile solution as one of the members of, of a partnership to make sure the right information gets to the right people in the right time. Uh, kind of innovating through mobile solutions is um, with our sepsis alert. We have a sepsis alert, like many organizations do, that uses predictive analytics. And we have a, uh, using our predictive analytics engine, we calculate the risk of a patient of having sepsis. Um, or, and we then push that through um, uh, to communicate with the 
care team. And one of the things that we're uh, uh, kind of a future vision that we're doing is instead of sending that message and paging someone or instead of taking that message and having an alert pop up in the EMR, we're going to take that message and send it through the mobile app. And again, the mobile app will tell us who is the right person taking care of the patient at that right time. And it can uh, push it to them so that they can receive the alert. So as an example, a patient can arrive in the Parkland ED um, with, with complaint of fever and cough. They can have labs ordered and drawn. And, and then the sepsis alert model can detect that the patient appears to be high risk. The alert will be sent to the nurse. Um, we can send it to the nurse through the mobile app. Um, and again, that can have much more PHI in it, much more useful information, actionable information. Then the nurse and the provider log into the EMR, pull up the patient's chart, uh, best practice advisory and alert will be uh, queued. So the minute they open the chart, the alert fires, telling them again the patient's high risk for sepsis. And attached to that alert is the sepsis management order set. So they accept the BPA, the order set becomes automatically submitted, and the patient receives appropriate hydration, appropriate culture, appropriate antibiotic, et cetera. Likewise, when they activate the sepsis order set, that can activate another alert that can cascade actions going through the mobile strategy to the ED nurse, the phlebotomy to come draw the cultures, to do a blood gas, pharmacy to get the antibiotics in a timely manner, and then the patient can get their first dose of antibiotics, go to the hospital, and hopefully have a better outcome because when it comes to sepsis, time is the end. Uh, strategy, uh, you can see that using the sepsis uh, predictive analytics platform, we've been able to improve our adherence with the three hour and, and overall bundle. Um, by by just using decision support, and you can uh, for improvement with these different measures. Lactate within three hours went up 18 percent. IV antibiotics went up 85 percent. We were not doing terrible with cultures, and it re remained about overall bundle compliance, which is a difficult thing to do. We improved over twofold um, from beginning this initiative to where we are, and we've been able to maintain it through FY16 and beyond. And then if you look at um, what's most important, which is the length of stay and then mortality, the length of stay, um, we've actually been able to show there's a, <coughs> excuse me, a reduction, an absolute reduction of about 2.2 days on the mean and, and, and a little, almost a day on the median length of stay of these separate patients. So the hope is that this is a, a surrogate marker saying that we're catching the patient sooner, we're treating them, and they're getting better, and they don't have to stay in the hospital as long. When we went ahead and looked at mortality, we actually have had a reduction, a relative reduction of 17.7% with initiation of this predictive analytic process and decision support within the EMR and activation of the team, and that's been impacted by the I just wanted to close. Who's doing? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Was I supposed to do the closing? Okay, we can pause. Joe, I think you wanted to do the closing remarks, right? Sure. We have taken our mobile in, uh, communication solution and we've tried to use it in a meaningful way at Parkland where we alert providers, nurses, and members of the care team. We're trying to improve the efficiency of the organization. And some examples of where we've done that include uh, pain uh, reassessment for nurses, uh, engagement of the care team when patients are being transported, use of attribution, uh, reassessment for uh, the, the, the bed, uh, nursing communication with patients for uh, patients needing to go to the toilet, those kind of things. We feel that the mobile strategy has helped us a lot from removing the middleman and improving uh, timeliness of attention of care to patients, which will hopefully show endpoints of improved outcomes, improved satisfaction, and overall allow us to spend more time taking care of our patients. Found from an IT perspective is we've added a platform that adds a capability. Uh, pursuant to what both Dr. Moran and, and Judy had demonstrated as part of this presentation. We've also allowed IT and the IT team members that support this platform and have implemented this platform 
to facilitate that continuum of care and pushing those uh, high alerts uh, closer to the, the people that need to get them and quicker. And we've become a de facto part of the care team ourselves in IT. And that makes us very proud about what we do. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, where to go find uh, this re this uh, and other daily use case uh, webinar recording um, and information on how to apply for Davies Award. Uh, this could be found at the at the Hims website, uh, Hims Davies website on hims.org backslash Davies. Um, you could find more information on um, the, the the Davies program and how to apply for it, and um, see other use case webinar along with this one. So thank you all for this uh, uh, this presentation.